The Australian Window Association and the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage through the Environmental Trust present Australian Fenestration and Energy Efficiency, a view from the top. Australia is committed to taking strong domestic and international action on climate change. The government is implementing national policies to reduce emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change in the context of coordinated global action. New policies are on the way that will impact strongly on your business and how you work. It's important to develop an understanding of these changes to ensure they benefit your business. You've no doubt heard about the Paris Agreement and know that it relates to climate change. This video provides a simple explanation of what it's all about and how it relates to your business. Enforcement of the agreement triggers a variety of important consequences and the development of an implementation rulebook. Completion of what is, in effect, a global blueprint for reporting and accounting for climate action. Countries are not starting from scratch. The many successful models and mechanisms for international climate cooperation over the past two decades, including the Kyoto Protocol, have built a deep level of experience and knowledge on how this can be done effectively. This will definitely impact the way we build and the materials we choose to build with. With windows and glazing often quoted as the thermal wounds of the building envelope, and the imminent energy efficiency stringency increases as early as 2019, there will need to be a reinvigorated effort in design innovation of windows and door systems to address these emerging needs. Australian businesses now need to consider the legal implications of the agreement's ratification. Let's take a look at the lead up to this. A United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC entered into force in March 1994 and now has near universal membership. It's been ratified by 197 countries. It represented the first time there'd been universal recognition that there was a global warming problem. The Kyoto Protocol followed and essentially operationalised the convention, forcing industrialised countries to commit to stabilising greenhouse gas emissions. An historic global climate agreement was agreed under the UNFCCC at the 21st Conference of the Parties in Paris in December 2015. The need to accelerate anti-global warming efforts was acknowledged. The Paris Agreement entered into a force on the 4th of November 2016, with Australia ratifying its acceptance five days later. Ahead of the Paris Conference, countries were invited to submit their indicative post-2020 targets, and these targets have been set by almost all parties to UNFCCC, including the G20 countries. These targets represent over 96% of global emissions, over 99% of global GDP, and 99.8% of Australia's two-way trade. The world is changing and businesses and regulators alike all need to change to stay relevant. This will drive business competition in a direction we've never previously seen. The Paris Agreement focuses on nationally determined contributions, which basically amounts to each country doing the best it can, depending on its specific circumstances. Each country has its own set of targets. The agreement states that developed countries should continue taking the lead by undertaking economy-wide absolute emission reduction targets. Developing countries should continue enhancing their mitigation efforts and are encouraged to move over time towards economy-wide emission reduction or limitation targets in the light of different national circumstances. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Each country has to show that it's pulling its weight by reporting back regularly on its emissions and implementation efforts. This is reinforced by a global stock take every five years to assess whether everyone is on track. The first of these stock takes will take place in 2023. So, as we've learned, the Paris Agreement sets in place a framework for all countries to take climate action from 2020 
building on existing international efforts leading up to that date. Key internationally agreed outcomes include a global goal to hold average temperature increases to well below 2 degrees Celsius and pursue efforts to keep warming below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. All countries to set mitigation targets from 2020 and review targets every five years to build ambition over time informed by global stocktake. Robust transparency and accountability rules to provide confidence in countries' actions and track progress towards targets. Promoting action to adapt and build resilience to climate impacts. Financial, technological and capacity building support to help developing countries implement the agreement. On ratifying the Paris Agreement, Australia indicated it would reduce emissions to 26 to 28 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030. This ambitious target builds on our 2020 target of reducing emissions by 5 per cent below 2000 levels. Australia's targets will be achieved through a policy suite that's already reducing emissions, encouraging technological innovation and expanding our clean energy sector. Australia is on track to meet its 2020 target. Essentially, this target represents a 50 to 52 per cent reduction in emissions per capita and a 61 to 65 per cent reduction in the emissions intensity of the economy between 2005 and 2030. Without significant action by the building sector, there's a real risk this target will not be met. Again, this flags to the window and glazing industry that given the significant manufacturing lead times from design through to market availability, now is the time to consider the pending demise of the very basic window types still in wide use in Australia and the need for systems with much better thermal efficiency within the next few years. So, why should you care? Buildings are responsible for more than 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. If current trends continue, CO2 emissions caused by the sector can be expected to increase 70% by 2050 and energy consumption will double. Over the same period, the expected growth of floor area to provide dwellings for an increasingly wealthy and larger global population will more than double the area covered by existing buildings. To achieve the goals agreed to, existing building stock will have to improve its energy performance significantly and new buildings must be made smarter, super efficient and CO2 lean. This will require significant changes in the way we design and market building product materials. Low carbon technologies are already being applied to renovations and new building projects, but their market share is still low. As the drive for more efficient products to meet emerging regulations ramp up, these already available technologies will be at the forefront of change and realise opportunities that competitors will have to meet. Market growth for these products will also have the effect of driving the prices down as we embrace the new norm. The European Union has made a commitment to eliminate the negative climate impacts of buildings. In a number of strategy documents, it's highlighted greenhouse gas reduction opportunities of up to 95% by the middle of the century. Buildings provide one of the most essential human needs, shelter. Adequate housing is a human right in itself, a right that can only be fulfilled if buildings are climate proofed, energy efficient and heated and cooled by renewable energy to the highest possible degree. Windows are considered passive products, that is, they don't use energy themselves, but given their inherent inefficiency, they can severely impact on the heating and cooling loads of a building. Again, the market is changing, and builders will have to become as knowledgeable as architects and building designers to ensure their competitiveness in our sustainable future. Critical components of the new policy suite are the energy efficiency standards in the National Construction Code, the NCC. The Australian Building Codes Board is now well into a project to update those energy efficiency provisions. 
This project was formally initiated as part of the National Energy Productivity Plan, NEPP, which was agreed to by the Council of Australian Governments Energy Council in December 2015. The NEPP notes that there is likely to be strong productivity and emissions reduction benefits from revising the NCC's energy proficiency provisions for both residential and commercial buildings. However, it also recognises that there is a need to gather more evidence around the effectiveness of the existing provisions, particularly in relation to residential buildings. Research found that changes to the NCC could achieve energy savings of up to 53% for commercial buildings, but only up to 18% for residential buildings. So we'll see an increase in the stringency of the energy efficiency provisions for commercial buildings in NCC 2019. This is important news for the building and construction industry, and in particular builders, who must comply with the code. For residential buildings, the aim is to improve interpretation and compliance with the current provisions and establish a solid foundation for increasing the stringency beyond NCC 2019. The Department of the Environment and Energy is carrying out research into the case for increasing residential stringency in the future. While the roof, walls and exposed floors may influence only a small portion of the building's overall cooling or heating needs, windows and glazing are likely to be the most important. The government and industry are working together to set a trajectory for increased energy efficiency for all buildings. To ensure compliance with regulation, current National Construction Code energy efficiency provisions can be found in the two volumes dedicated to buildings. Volume 1 covers building classes 2 to 9 and these regulatory requirements are commonly called Section J or specifically for glazing, Part J2. One of the most important requirements noted in the code for reducing the energy consumption of commercial buildings is the treatment of glazing and its interaction with artificial light. Both of these aspects influence the amount of energy that heating, ventilation, air conditioning and lighting systems use. One of the main considerations in the design of mechanical equipment for a building is the heating or cooling load resulting from the glazing. Correctly designed and installed glazing may reduce the size and operating load of the equipment needed to air condition a building. NCC Volume 1 sets an allowance for glazing in terms of the facade area for each orientation that encloses a conditioned space and an index based on the climate zone and glazing application. There's a method for predicting performance based on an equation. The equation assesses the impact of the glazing on the calculated amount of energy that the air conditioning will use over the course of a typical year. The calculations in Part J2 can be done longhand or be automated using a spreadsheet calculator. There's an ABC glazing calculator and other tools that have been developed by industry and associations. If used incorrectly, glazing elements risk becoming a major weakness in the insulated building envelope. In NCC Volume 2 for Housing, the treatment of glazing to limit unwanted heat gain or loss is one of the most important aspects of the energy efficiency requirements. It's covered in Part 3.12.2. Volume 2 sets separate maximum allowances for conductance and for solar heat gain. Two equations are then used to calculate the performance of the proposed glazing layout for comparison with those allowances. The equations take into account glazing area, glazing thermal properties, solar orientation and external shading projections or shading devices. For the purposes of the NCC, glazing refers to windows, glazed doors and other transparent or translucent elements, such as glass bricks, located in the building fabric. A glazing element includes the glass or other glazing material, any air or gas fuel, and the supporting frames. The NCC requires glazing products to be rated in accordance with the Australian Fenestration Rating Council's protocols and procedures. Standardised ratings of glazing products ensures that a valid comparison can be made between the performances of different glazed systems. This ensures that consumers, designers and builders alike can compare apples with apples. 
The stringency of the NCC Volume 2 glazing requirements increased in BCA 2010 as part of the move to a nominal six-star equivalent for the elemental deemed to satisfy provisions, and a new glazing calculation method was applied for buildings. The combined effect of these changes is that it may be challenging to design a compliant glazing solution using the elemental deemed to satisfy provisions and associated glazing calculator. Early assessment of the glazing design between the building designer and energy rater, including the size, orientation and shading of glazing elements, is critical as high performance glazing alone may no longer be relied on to achieve compliance. Another crucial element to this assessment is to contact window manufacturers to ensure the values or measurements necessary to meet the code are readily available and can be purchased in your particular state or territory. The new energy requirements coming from the Paris Agreement will require all sectors of the building industry to move swiftly to ensure that products, information and construction remain ahead of any newly mandated levels of energy efficiency. This will require innovation, forward thinking research and development, as well as education and training for all sectors of the construction industry. This project has been funded by the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage through the Environmental Trust. For more information, visit awa.org.au, words.net or efficientglazing.net.